Our next speaker is going to be Katie Whitehouse. She is working for the Access Campaign, and she's going to um, look at a very uh, difficult topic, which is essentially pediatric HIV diagnosis in a non-PMTCT setting, so looking at how to improve and where to best um, diagnose patients. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so to give you some context on why we conducted this uh, systematic review, um, we know that globally, the number of children living with HIV under the age of 15 years is approximately 3.2 million. 90% of those live in sub-Saharan Africa. And reducing mortality of infants infected at or around birth is, uh, is achieved with early treatment initiation. So in order to initiate treatment, you need a diagnosis. Um, and we know that there is an increase in the number of uh, tests that are being conducted on children, but these are still insufficient numbers. There are ambitious global targets and a renewed focus on efficiencies in order to achieve uh, a bridging of this gap. Um, and new strategies are needed in order to um, increase the number of infants being tested. So the review was conducted to inform um, and update the WHO's global guidance um, on identifying these strategies and um, finding HIV positive children. So we formulated the following research question, which is that for children in low and middle income countries, does HIV screening in four key contexts enable a higher yield of HIV diagnosis when compared with, H, uh, with screening in prevention of mother-to-child transmission settings. So those four key contexts are pediatric inpatient, pediatric outpatient, nutrition centers, and essential programs for immunization. So our methods, we limited to 2004 to 2014 studies published in English or in French in the four key contexts mentioned, and we looked at under 12 HIV prevalence. Uh, we included either serological or molecular testing and either universal or triggered screening protocols and needed an HIV positivity of those tested included in the studies. We excluded anything outside of those four key contexts. Um, we excluded diagnostic <laughs> testing and we excluded uh, studies where testing criteria was not stated. Um, we also didn't include studies that uh, had highly specialised um, or specific out or inpatient care. So, for example, TB. Um, we searched the databases using a highly sensitive uh, search strategy, uh, extracted titles um, in duplicate and reviewed everything in duplicate and had a third party tiebreaker. And we uh, age disaggregated our outcomes and pulled the data users using random effects meta-analysis. So a review, we found 2,890 studies after deduplication of the main databases, identified 38 studies with HIV prevalence data, and of those, 25 with specific under five HIV prevalence. And those are the results that I'm going to present uh, today. So an overview, as I, as I said, 25 studies with primary outcomes, so that's under five HIV diagnosis, uh, with 15 reporting secondary outcomes. So we also extracted data around acceptance rates by caregivers for HIV testing. We looked at retention in care, and we also looked at feasibility or acceptability uh, and uptake by healthcare workers. Um, I'm not gonna present secondary results today, but you, you can ask me about them. Um, geographically, uh, 23 studies were in sub-Saharan Africa. One was from India, and one was from Papua New Guinea. And the majority of studies came from pediatric inpatient settings, with 16 studies reporting those outcomes. <coughs> so to have a look at our results, um, there's, a, there's a fair degree of heterogeneity in these results. Um, but what we can see when we look at pediatric inpatient settings, which is the top section of this forest plot, um, we can see that uh, the pool proportion was 25.3% um, for HIV positivity in under five. Um, if, 
uh, if we look at um, nutrition uh, settings, which is the second uh, section down, that reduces to about 13.1%. And in EPI settings, uh, again, reduces to 49 uh, with outpatients the lowest um, HIV positivity rate at one62 what we can say is that these, offer, these results offer us uh, a certain amount um, of, of direction whereby to investigate new settings to, uh, to try and find HIV positivity in paediatric patients. Um, and to give you some context uh, for why this is relevant to MSF, we did a, a very quick um, extraction of one operational centre, so one section's um, uh, offering of HIV testing to paediatrics um, in, in projects where there's a, an, an HIV focus within the country. So to have a look at those results, again, this is just, this is just one section. Um, and many thanks to Helen for um, helping us out and, and pulling this data together for us. Uh, we can see that broadly, um, HIV testing for paediatrics is available, but primarily if symptomatic. And um, where it is available, there are a number of barriers that healthcare workers uh, noted as to why it's, it's difficult to offer HIV testing. And those include availability of trained counsellors, uh, consent for testing, and uh, the confidence to provide testing and to disclose results. So, no, no testing is available in EPI uh, settings, uh, and I think that's, that's worthy of note. In terms of a breakdown as to the number of projects, as compared uh, where um, HIV prevalence is greater than 1% within the country that the projects are operating, we see that the number of projects actually offering testing is, is, is substantially different uh, from that number. So if we look at uh, inpatient departments, uh, we see 18 projects are operating in countries with a prevalence greater than 1%, but only four are actually offering HIV testing to those paediatric patients. So there needs to be some work done as to how we improve the situation within MSF itself. Um, and so some of the recommendations that we've pulled together are that we need a bigger emphasis on postpartum retesting of mothers in EPI contexts, which would be much easier than actually testing the paediatric uh, patients. There's an ongoing lobby. Um, the HIV working group and the paediatric working group are both proponents um, within MSF to integrate HIV testing into um, paediatric projects. And there is, there is guideline uh, training and support materials available, which have also been developed intersectionally. Um, so there are no excuses. So to have a look back at the review, um, I just want to note a couple of main limitations um, of our systematic uh, research. Um, the studies were limited by language. Um, so that may have an indicator for um, other studies that are available um, not published in English or French. Uh, we limited by date um, and to lower and middle income country contexts. The data that's primarily available is only really for under fives. It's very difficult for us to have uh, disaggregated the data for the five to 12 year olds. And that will be interesting and that's something that we're, con we're continuing to try and work on. <laughs> Um, and the data is only really from sub-Saharan Africa and in inpatient settings. Um, not all of the studies provided uh, comparable background prevalence data, um, so they're either inadequate or indirectly comparable. And PMTCT coverage changes um, have occurred in, since some of the studies were published. So to look briefly at our recommendations, we have one main policy recommendation, which is that testing paediatric populations in some key contexts may well offer high yield opportunities to identify HIV infected children. And notably, paediatric inpatient settings would appear to be the, the most pragmatic approach. And our research recommendation is that we definitely need more studies from other settings, uh, including nutrition, outpatient, and EPI. With only three studies apiece in this systematic review, it's, it's quite difficult to, um, to really draw strong conclusions on that. 
Um, and we definitely need studies outside of sub-Saharan African contexts. And in order to address the barriers that were raised, um, notably within the MSF projects that I mentioned, um, whilst HIV testing is already recommended, the uptake is low, and we need to consider how to address training needs, uh, what to do about the availability of testing and counselling, and the legal barriers, uh, so age of consent to test, um, must all be addressed in order to um, improve the situation. So many thanks to the uh, brilliant collaborators and colleagues that I've, I've had the pleasure to work with on this. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for an excellent talk and for a very important, uh, to cover a very important topic. Again, it's just technical questions we are going to take and then hopefully we will touch on that subject again in the discussion round. Any questions? Thanks, Katie. That's a very interesting talk. I mean, as you say, the recommendation for testing kids has been around for a long time now, and I guess I was very surprised to see how low the rates of testing are. Did, has somebody looked at what the actual reasons are? Do we have any data on why? I, I know there are possible theories, but has someone actually collected reasons for why we're not testing? Um, I'm not actually sure, but there are, there are a few people, uh, notably in the front row, who probably have, um, who probably have an idea as, as to why. I don't know if, Helen, you want to? I think um, you might need to. So, as you know, Daniel, a long debate within MSF. Some sections are better at it than others. Um, still, the question comes back to, are we going to test who's going to treat them, believe it or not? Still in 2015, that discussion goes on. Um, so it's something we're still really, really pushing uh, the nutrition projects and uh, paediatric projects towards, that it should just be a normal part of, of the care we're providing, but we're not quite there yet. Thank you. Any other questions? So there's, there are questions from the online audience. Yes. Um, I have a question from MSF India who are asking, is there a reason why we're not testing at present, and is there a qualitative research study planned? <laughs> Uh, I, I've got no plans for a qualitative, uh, for qualitative analysis um, as yet, but um, reasons for not testing, I think, are, are probably covered mostly by the, the challenges and the barriers. Um, it, it's very difficult um, to address age of consent issues. Um, I think a number of healthcare workers feel quite uncomfortable with providing testing uh, for paediatrics when um, either... Um, either the, the, the paediatric is a little bit older and, and there's that blurred line between um, sort of a, a minor and, a, and an adult. Um, I think also dis disclosure is another aspect within age of consent. Um, disclosing a, a, an HIV positive result when the, the parent or the caregiver hasn't actually initiated the test is, is, is probably problematic. And then, um, and then in terms of availability of staff, you know, the MSF projects all noted that it's very difficult to have staff available, ready to give trained counselling. Um, and then within EPI context, it, it, it's quite a quick turnaround of, of paediatrics. Um, so you, you're seeing them very briefly. Um, so actually, we, we probably need to look at a different strategy, uh, i.e. testing mothers rather than, or, or caregivers rather than the paediatric themselves. If I can just add to that, even so it's not an MSF project, but it's from Zimbabwe. So I have been working with Rashida Ferrand on adolescent testing. And we actually had six primary care clinics where we tested, where we had provider-initiated testing. And only 70% of the children got the test offered by the healthcare providers mm -hmm. because the healthcare providers weren't very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And we did a qualitative piece around that and asked why are you not testing the children, even so, you know, this is, we have trained you for doing that. And really the main barriers were A, running out of test kits because uh, PMTCT is prioritized. The second bit was not really being sure if a guardian who is not the mother or the father mm. is going to be allowed to consent, age of consent, and how to actually do the test in the context of, of a young person. And following that, we did a big kind of stakeholder um, and training campaign and that brought the offering of testing up to 95%. So I mean, it is achievable, but you really need to bring your healthcare providers on board. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to think about moving from something which we call provider-initiated testing, where the provider still says, 
what is the risk? I'm going to do it on a symptom basis because I'm more comfortable with mm. that. That patient probably has HIV and that one doesn't, to a real routine opt-out testing for children and adolescents. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you.